know what? I'm going to get some coffee, and then I'm going to teach you guys Python. Does that sound good? The power of Python. The Python language is becoming more and more popular, and in 2017 it became the most popular language in the world, according to IEE Spectrum. The power of Python is real. Python is the number one language because it's easy to learn and use. I agree with that. Due partly to its simplified syntax and natural language flow, but also to the amazing user community and the breadth of applications available. Python's really important for machine learning and AI and stuff like that, so I think that that's all correct. After we have introduced you to language, we will step into the world of AI, programming, exploring programming in the machine learning and neural networks using Python and TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a very important uh, Google library, which is open source, but I, I believe Google created it, and it's a really crucial uh, AI tool. So anyway, like I said, I got this book for a bunch of my prisoner pals. Um, one of the prisons I was in wouldn't let me actually get the book. Uh, so I bought a number of copies, but they wouldn't actually even let me bring it into the prison, which is crazy, right? I think for like 30 bucks, whatever this book has cost, it's, it's, it's worth like a million dollars of net present value to your life, possibly, if you want to learn Python, because it's, uh, it's a good book and it actually does go through some pretty complicated things, but believe it or not. Foolish assumptions, this is why. We assume that you know how to use a computer in a basic way. If you could turn on the computer, and use a mouse, right? You're ready for this book. We assume that you don't know how to program yet, although you will have some skills in programming by the end of the book. If we're wrong and you already know Python or some other computer programming language, jump ahead to Minibook 4 and dig right into learning something new. Our intent is to guide you through the language of Python and then to, through some of the amazing technologies and devices that use Python. We provide concrete examples. If you get stuck on something, look it on the web, read the tutorial, and come back to it. We're going to discover why Python is hot, finding the tools for success, and the other two things I just mentioned. Okay, so because you're reading this chapter, you'll probably realize that Python is a great language to know if you're looking for a good job in programming, or if you want to expand your existing programming skills into exciting, cutting-edge technologies, such as AI, ML, data science, or robotics, or even if you're just building apps in general. So we're not going to try to sell you on Python. It sells itself. Our approach leans heavily towards the hands-on. A common failure in many programming tutorials is that they already assume you're a professional programmer in some language and they skip over things they assume you already know. This book is different. We don't assume that you know anything about programming in Python or any other language. We do assume you can use a computer and understand basics such as files and folders. We also assume you're not uh, up for settling down an easy chair in front of a fireplace to read page after page after theoretical, of theoretical stuff under Python that's like some kind of boring novel. You don't have that much free time to kill. So we're going to get right to it and focus on doing, hands-on, because that's the way, only way most of us learn. We've never seen anyone read a Python book and then sit on a computer and write Python like a pro. Human brains don't work that way. We learn through practice and repetition, and that requires being hands-on. Okay, why is Python hot? We promised we wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to sell you on Python, and that's not our intent, but we'd like to talk briefly about why it's so hot. Python is pri hot primarily because it has all the right stuff for working on the kind of software development that's dr driving the software development world these days. Machine learning, ML, robotics, AI, and data science, are the leading technologies today and for the foreseeable future. Py this is written before ChatGPT. Python is popular mainly because it already has lots of cap capabilities in these areas, while many of older languages lag behind these technologies. Just as there are different brands of toothpaste, shampoo, cars, and just about every other product you can buy, there are different brands of programming languages, with names such as Java, C, C++, and C Sharp. They're all programming languages, just like brands of toothpaste are toothpaste. The main reason cited for Python's current popularity is Python is relatively easy to learn. I would completely agree with that. Everything you need to learn and do Python is free. Well, that's typical of most languages. Python offers more ready-made tools for current hot technologies, such as data science, machine learning, AI, and robotics, than most other languages. That's definitely true. I disagree with this part a little bit. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Some of you may have heard of languages such as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Those aren't traditional programming languages for developing apps or other generic software. HTML and CSS are specialized for developing web pages. And although JavaScript is a programming language, it is heavily geared to website development and isn't quite in the same category of general programming languages such as Python and Java. I'm rolling my names, uh, rolling my eyes there. If you specifically want to design and create websites, you have to learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, whether you're familiar with Python or some other programming language. Figure 1-1 one, one shows Google search trends for the last five years. I guess, as you can see, Python has been gaining popularity, as indicated by the upward slope, whereas other languages have stayed the same or declined. This certainly supports the notion that Python is the language most people want to learn 
uh, right now and for the future. Most people would agree that the, given the trends in modern computing, learning Python is the best opportunity for getting a secure, high-paying job in the world of information technology. You can do your own Google search trends at trends.google.com. Choosing the right Python. There are different versions of Python running out in the world, prompting many a beginner to wonder things like, why are there different versions? How are they different? Which one should I learn? All good questions, but we'll start with the first. The version is kind of like a car year. You can go out and buy a 1968 Ford Mustang, a 1990 Ford Mustang, or a 2019 or 2020 Ford Mustang, but they're all Ford Mustangs. The only difference is that the one with the highest year number is the most current Ford Mustang. That Mustang is different from the other models and that has some improvements based on experience with earlier models, as well as some features current with the times. Programming languages and most other software products work the same way. But as a rule, we don't ascribe year numbers to them because they're not released on a yearly basis. They're released whenever they're released. But the principle is the same. The version with the highest number is the newest, most recent model, sporting improvements based on experience with earlier versions and features relevant to the current times. Just as we use a decimal point with money to separate dollars from cents, we use decimal points with version numbers to indicate how much the software has changed. When there's a significant change, the entire version is usually changed. Most minor changes are expressed with decimal points. You can see how the version numbers changed uh, according to uh, the year in Table 1.1, which shows that release dates of various Python versions. We skipped a few releases because there's a little reason, there is little reason to know or understand the differences between all the versions. We present the table only so you can see how the newer versions have uh, higher version numbers. That's all that matters. So you can see Python 3.9 was released in October 2020. Python 2.7, though, was July 2010. But Python 3 was before that in December 20, 2008. If you paid close attention, you may have realized that 3.0 starts in December 2008, but 2.7 was 2010. So if versions are like car years, why the overlap? The car years analogy just indicates that the larger the number, the more recent the version. But in Python, the year is the most recent within the main Python version. When the first number changes, that's usually a change that's so significant, software written in prior versions might not even work with that version. If you happen to be at a software company with a product written in Python 2 on the market and have millions of dollars invested in that product, you may not be too thrilled to have to start over from scratch to go with the current version. So older versions continue to be supported and evolve independent of the most recent version to support developers and businesses that have already invested in the previous version. The biggest question on most beginners' mind is, what version should I learn? The answer is simple, whatever's the most common version. You'll know that when you go to python.org to download Python, which I recommend you do right now in a separate window, it will tell you uh, the most current stable build or version. That's the one uh, they'll recommend and that's the one you should use. Most of what's in Python is the same across all the versions. So you don't need to worry about investing uh, time learning version that is or will soon become obsolete. All right, how about some tools for success? Now we need to get started, uh, get your computer set up so you can learn, do, and, uh, learn and do Python hands-on. For one, you'll need a good Python interpreter and editor. The editor lets you type the code, the interpreter lets you run the code. When you run or execute the code, you're telling the computer to do whatever my code tells you to do. The term code refers to anything written in a computer programming language that provides instructions to a computer. The term coding is often used to describe the act of writing code. A code editor is an app that lets you type code in much the same way that an app such as Word or Pages lets you type regular plain English text. Just as there are many brands of toothpaste, there are many code editors that work well with Python. There isn't a right one or a wrong one or a good one or a bad one or a best one or a worst one. Just a lot of different products that basically do the same thing but very slightly in their approach and what the editor's creators think is good. If you're already if you've already started learning Python and you're happy with what you're using, keep using it. But if you're just getting started, we suggest, and Martin Shkreli suggests, you use VS Code because it's an excellent free learning environment. Introducing Anaconda in VS Code. The editor we can recommend and we'll be using this book is called Visual Studio Code, but most often it's called VS Code. The main reason is it's an excellent editor for learning coding. It's an excellent editor for writing code professionally. It's used by millions of uh, professional programmers and developers, including us over at DL Software. It's relatively easy to learn and use. It's pretty much the same on Windows, Macs, and Linux, and it's free. The editor is an important part of learning and writing Python code. So you also need, though, a, a Python interpreter. Chances are you're gonna wanna also uh, want some Python packages. Packages are simply code, this is very important. Packages are simply code written by someone else to do common tasks that you don't have to start from scratch uh, and reinvent the wheel every time you want to perform one of those tasks. Python packages are not a crutch for beginners. They are major components of the entire Python development environment 
and are used by seasonal seasoned professionals as much as beginners. Historically, managing Python to packages in the editor was a somewhat laborious task involving cryptic commands at the command prompt. That's not a particularly bad thing, it's, it, but it isn't the most efficient way to do things, especially when you're first getting started. You end up spending a lot of time up front trying to learn and type awkward commands just to get Python working on your computer rather than learning Python itself. An excellent alternative to the command line is using a Python integrated development environment with a more intuitive and easily managed graphic user interface uh, such as Anaconda. It's free and excellent. If you've never heard of it before, go to anaconda.com and again, I, I recommend you uh, download it. Got uh, Anaconda installed myself. Anaconda is often referred to as a data science platform because many of the packages that come with it are data science oriented. But don't let that worry you if you're interested in doing other things with Python. Anaconda is excellent for learning and doing all kinds of things with Python. And it comes with VS Code, our personal favorite coding editor, as well as Jupyter Notebook, which is another excellent means for learning to code with Python. And best of all, it's 100% free. So it's well worth downloading it and installing it. Uh, so go ahead and do that in VS Code. Most of the Python coding we do here we'll do in VS Code. Whenever you want to use VS Code to write Python, open VS Code from Anaconda instead of the start menu. This way VS Code will already be pointing to the most pointing to the version of Python that comes from Anaconda, which is easier than trying to figure that all out yourself. So open Anaconda Navigator, and then I guess there's a VS Code. Let me, let me see if that's, um, and then we're gonna talk about Git. <laughs> Git is a way to store backups of your coding projects and share coding projects with other developers or team members. It's popular with professional programmers and VS Code is built in support for it. But Git is optional and not directly related to learning Python. So it's perfectly okay to, to choose, don't show this again but you can install Git whenever you want later, which I, I recommend you do. This is called the Anaconda Navigator, um, but we'll use it now. And let's see if there's a, I think there's supposed to be a VS Code thing here somewhere. Here's VS Code. All right, launch, I'm hit the launch button. And we launched it. The first time you open VS Code, you may be prompted to make some decisions. You could just click X on each one. When you're finished, the library or the, the window will look something like this. Your screen will be black. In this book, we show everything in white. You can change that um, in the menu. Visual Studio Code is a generic uh, code editor. It works with lots of different languages. So it's good to get some extensions though for Python and Anaconda. Um, so we can click the extension page. Here it is on the left here. You can actually see different kinds of extensions. I have a lot of ones for JavaScript because that's kind of like my primary thing. But let's see if I type in Python, what happens? All right, I have Python one installed. And uh, let's see if I got Anaconda. Oh, this one's Anaconda terminal. I don't think that's what I want. All right, it's choosing your Python interpreter. Go to view command palette, view command palette, that's control shift P is a lot easier. And then type Python and then type select interpreter. And there's a bunch of ones to choose from. I see Python 10, Python 11, 3.10, 3 3.11. Um, I suppose we can try the most recent one, right? Okay, writing some Python code. So we're gonna click view and then I guess terminal, which is control um, tilde or control uh, backtick. And here we have um, the terminal. So we can type Python and hit enter. And we're in this something called a REPL, R-E-P-L, read, evaluate, print loop. And um, let's see, we could type one plus one and we get two. We can type one plus three, we get four. We could do three to the fourth power. That's 81, because three times three is nine, times three is uh, uh, 27, times three is 81. Okay, so all this seems to work. We can exit this way and many other ways. Now uh, using Jupyter Notebook for coding, interesting. Jupyter Notebook is another popular tool for writing Python code. The name Jupyter comes from the fact that it supports three popular languages. Julia, J-U, 
Python, PYT, and R, Jupyter. Cool, huh? Julia and R are popular for data science. Python is a more generic programming language that happens to also be popular in data science as well, but Python is good for all kinds of development, not just data science. The notebook part of the name comes from the fact that your code is placed in structures similar to a regular paper notebook. People often use Jupyter to share code on the internet. It's free and it comes with Anaconda. So let's go to Anaconda and click launch under Jupyter. Where is Jupyter? There it is. Uh, well, there's Jupyter Lab and then there's Notebook. Let's try Notebook. All right, it opened a little web page here. And I think I can click new and hit Python 3. Jupyter Notebooks are web-based. So when Jupyter opens, it does so in Safari, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, or IE. At first, it doesn't look like it has much to do with coding but you have to open the notebook up. So now you'll see this in, in brackets with a colon. This is called a cell. And a cell can contain either code or regular text and pictures. If you want to write code, make sure the dropdown on the toolbar displays code. Change that menu option to Markdown if you want to write regular text. Markdown is language for writing text that uses fonts, pictures, and such. We'll talk more about that in the next chapter. For now, let's stay on, focused on Python code because that's what this book is about. A cell is not like a Python interpreter where your code runs immediately. You have to write some code first and then run the code by clicking the run button in the toolbar. Let's click inside this, type one plus one and hit enter. Nothing happens. To get the result, we have to click run. And then we see the output, input one plus one, output two. Okay, so the extension is IPYNB. The PYNB part is short for Python Notebook. The I is IPython, which is the name of the app from which Jupyter Notebook was created and is short for interactive. So you have a great set of tools for learning Python. We're all set up. The simple skills you learn in this chapter will serve you well, as well as your professional programming after you've mastered the basics. Let's go to chapter two now. I'm glad you all have set this up with me and we're ready to learn Python. All right, chapter two, using interactive mode, creating a development workspace, creating a folder for your code, typing, editing, and debugging code, and writing code in Jupyter. Interactive mode, getting help, and writing apps. Now that you've installed Anaconda and VS Code, we're ready to start digging deeper into writing Python code. In this chapter, we'll take you through the interactive help and code editing features of VS Code and Jupyter to build on what we've learned so far. Most of you are probably anxious to get started on more advanced topics, such as data science, AI, robotics, or whatever. But learning those topics will be easier if you have a good understanding of the tools and the skills to use them. Using Python's interactive mode. Many teachers and authors will suggest that you try things hands-on at the Python prompt and assume you already know how to get there. We've seen many frustrated beginners complain training activities recommended never work for them. The frustration often stems from the fact that they're typing and executing code in the wrong place. With Anaconda, the terminal pane in VS Code is a great place to type uh, Python code. So in this chapter, let's go there. And again, you can press Control, Backtick, and it just comes up. Or you can click Terminal, New Terminal, Lots of different ways to do it. So let's type Python hyphen hyphen version, and you'll see it's Python 3.912 here. I wrote the uh, code for Dr. Gupta's uh, business logic, and my colleagues wrote the infrastructure. So that's how we look up the Python version number. If you're getting an error message, let me know, because that's not what's supposed to be happening. This should be pretty easy. So if we type Python, we'll, we'll get into the Python interpreter. Here it says some stuff about Anaconda. PyLint is a feature of Anaconda that helps you avoid code. Sometimes it's called linting. So if you want to install PyLint, you're welcome to do that. So now again, we, we type Python in and we have this prompt. This again is called the REPL, read, evaluate, print loop, R-E-P-L. All right, so if we try to type howdy or something like that, we get an error, right? Howdy is not defined. The interpreter doesn't understand what we mean. But you can't break anything. So you can type that, and you'll see some gibberish that tells you it doesn't know what howdy means. But nothing is broken. You can just keep trying again and again. Now let's try to use help. If we type help, we get another error message, which says type help with parentheses. So I'll do that. And you get a bunch of different help uh, messages here. And they mention there's a tutorial with a link there. And we could also enter some keywords uh, here in this help mode. So we're kind of in this weird help mode at the moment. So we can type um, keywords. That's a good idea. I spelled it wrong. 
there we go, keywords. These are all the keywords in Python. It's actually a very small amount if you look at it, and you can memorize every single one of these, right? That's not very much at all. Imagine a language with only like English or French or something like that with only, what is this? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 36 words. That's very, very few. So I guess we can try like class, a class definition. This is pretty complicated. We don't have to worry about that right now. Just press enter until it's done. And we left the Python help interpreter by just continuing to hit enter over and over again. You can also press Q or control Z. And of course you can Google or go to Stack Overflow or something like that. YouTube is also pretty good. Okay, so creating a Python development workspace. We wanna create apps, right? So this, this terminal was not good enough for that. So we found that creating apps is easiest if you set up a VS Code development environment specifically for learning and coding Python. You can set up other development environments in other languages, such as HTML for the web, fine tuning each as you go to support whatever language you're working in. We often switch between Mac and Windows computers, so we have one development environment for each. One of the authors has a OneDrive folder. Um, in another environment, another uh, way to do it is to have your environment on your hard drive rather than the cloud drive. VS Code uses the term workspace to define what we'll call development environment. The development environment is the Python interpreter you're using, plus any extensions you gather along the way. So you can launch it from an Anaconda, and then we can say file, save workspace as. So I'm not gonna actually do that because I don't think it's that important. And you can choose different settings and stuff like that. Create a folder for your Python code. That's up to you guys. Um, I just have a folder on my machine called code. Okay, let's create um, a Python file. So we're just gonna hit file, new file, and I click Python. And I can type in, this is a Python file, and I can save it. And let's see, I can save it here. And I can call it hello.py. And you can see, it's, this is the file name. This extension is always p.py. Print, hello world. And if we want to run this file, so I've saved it. And let's say we want to run it. We can right click. Let's see, open folder. Right click and run Python file on terminal. And it's running it, doing all kinds of magic. And you can see the text hello world came out. I can go change uh, this text to say, hello YouTube. Hello YouTube stream, and if I press uh, the same stuff, run Python file and terminal, it'll say hello YouTube stream. So this is a one line computer program. And it'll be, if some for some of you, this will be your first computer program ever. Hello YouTube stream, how are you? Again, this will work. And if this is your first computer program, congratulations. You're a programmer now. This app is not the most exciting one in the world, but at least now you know how to write, save, and execute a Python program in VS Code, a skill you'll be using as you continue through this book and throughout your Python career. Okay, when you're first learning to write code, you're bound to make a lot of mistakes. Making mistakes is no big deal. You won't break or destroy anything. Your code just won't work as expected. Before you attempt to run some code, you might see several screen indications of an error. The name of the file will be in red in Explorer. That's a really nice thing about VS Code. The number of errors will be in red next to the file name. The number of errors will have us will appear with a circled X, and the bad code will have a wavy um, red underline. So if we try to do print in capital letters, you'll see that wavy underline there, right? You can't do that. Python has to be in lower cases. There's also a debugger. Um, so this is a little more complicated. Um, so let's click debug. So with debug, we'll have a bunch of options at some point that could be come in handy down the road. So let's go to the Jupyter Notebook this time. Same concept of saving and whatnot in Jupyter. I use Control-Enter 
it held control and pressed enter to get the output. But it could also have clicked run. You can also do alt enter. So markdown text. I guess they don't want to teach markdown right now, but we can do a little bit of markdown if we click markdown, hashtag markdown text, or we could just say hello everyone. These are just comments and not code. We could even put photos and stuff like that. And if we click run, nothing happens, right? There's nothing There's nothing to run in Markdown. It actually gets formatted a little, but there's nothing special that's going on there because it's not code, it's Markdown. All right, so now we're going to finally get started in writing some, some more code.